Welcome to Learning Aloud, a podcast from the Organizational Dynamics Community at the University of Pennsylvania, produced to inspire purposeful leadership practice and transform organizational experience. I am your host, Stephen G. Hart. My guest today is Josh Gibson an organizational dynamics alum who is now Director of Learning and Development for the Cleveland Indians baseball team. Josh has worked for several notable college and professional sports teams before he joined the Indians in 2018. In his current role, he's responsible for two primary areas, developing the developers, building professional development resources in the organization for staff members, and learning from outside organizations whereby he seeks to integrate helpful practices and processes into his own organization. Josh has dropped by our Zoom room today to talk about his work and to tell me how his experience in Penn's organizational dynamics program provided him with the opportunity to pursue his passion in learning, development, and leadership. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Stephen. Super excited to be here. It's great to have you. Now, your career so far has all been, been all about sports, really. So you started out in college with the Oregon football team, then you moved to the Philadelphia Eagles, and now you're with the Cleveland Indians. So how did you get started on this career path? Yeah, so I guess it all started um, back at the University of Oregon. So I was a business student there. And, you know, went through college where I was, I, was, I did well, but, you know, nothing was really motivating me or I didn't have a true calling in my career until I got an internship my senior year uh, with the Oregon football program. And once I, I stepped foot in those doors and got access to the people in that building, like a, a switch just flipped for me. And it was a whole new kind of energy than what I was used to experiencing. And so, you know, once I started working in the program, I absolutely fell in love with it. And um, so that was the second semester of my senior year. And I knew it was kind of, you know, it was going to wrap up here soon and didn't know what the prospects were for actually working in sports beyond that semester. But um, at my graduation, they actually offered me a like a, a little small stipend internship, what we call like a graduate assistant position in sports to be, basically be able to, to pay the rent in Eugene, Oregon, and <laughs> just make a small living to continue to work um, as kind of an entry-level employee. And so I obviously accepted that. I stayed in Eugene, Oregon, and um, just continued to fall in love with the work. And right around that time, um, we hired a guy by the name of Chip Kelly from the University of New Hampshire to be our offensive coordinator. We also hired someone by the name of James Harris, who had worked at Nebraska. He'd worked at Arizona State. He was kind of coming in to do like life skills and player development while also being a nutritionist and strength and conditioning coach. He had this unique background. So anyway, the three of us, you know, I don't know exactly how it happened, but we became close and started working on a lot of projects together over the course of about a year, year and a half. And I think it was just clear that we kind of thought the same. We, we, we created this bond and, um, you, know, you know, about a year into that, it was about that time where like, okay, this, this stipend graduate assistant program, we, I gotta maybe start looking at like a real career here and maybe moving out of Eugene, Oregon. Um, but right around that time, and, and timing is everything, um, our head coach, who we had the, the second longest tenured coaching staff in college football to Joe Paterno in Penn State at the time. And our coach had been there for 20 years and he stepped down, he retired. And Chip was then promoted to be the head coach. And so that gave me, you know, when he stepped in, it, he gave me a full-time opportunity to actually have a substantial role in the program. So I was able to, to continue the dream and stay on and, and work you know, James and I worked to really help turn Chip's vision and other people in the program's vision into a reality. And, um, you know, it, it was it was an incredible experience there starting that out. And I think one thing that stuck out to me that that led me to this point is part of that vision was this like learning organization concept. And we didn't call it that at the time, but everything was about being cutting edge, being innovative. Um, you know, we'd always talk about the, you know, we never want to do things just because that's the way it's been done before. 
Uh, we always want to push the envelope. So this led to just a ton of learning, a ton of research, trying to figure out the best way to get things done. Um, and I think that mindset really, you know, at the beginning of my career shaped me to be able to continue to take these steps. Like you said, go to the Eagles, go to the Indians, work for some other teams um, and really enjoy doing it. It's wonderful how you've embraced all of that. And it sort of goes to my next question, because I read something that you wrote uh, recently in, uh, on LinkedIn. You wrote, what if success in the future was less about structure and expertise and more about learning to play in the chaos? What if it was building comfort around knowing how much we don't know? I love that. This sounds uh, quite a different approach to business strategy that I'm, one, that I'm used to, but what were you thinking when you wrote this and how does this approach apply to your work now in professional sports? Yeah, so this was actually an assignment for an OD class uh, from Michael Arena. Mm. So it was one of the last assignments I did in the program. And I think I was pulling at the time from an analogy we learned in your class, Stephen, and, and that was this, this, this analogy of music and business. And um, so if I was to break it down for you, you know, if you think of like a typical pop band or someone who's going to play at like the Macy's Day Parade or a, a New Year's in New York, like everything is very canned. Everything is very scripted and planned and lip synced. And, um, and so I think the challenge of that is if things deviate slightly, they are like that, that structure actually becomes a hamstring for them versus other types of music, like if you're a, j a jazz ensemble, if you're a, a jam band, which, I, you know, like I love listening to like the Dave Matthews band or Widespread Panic or Fish, they are much more about operating within fluidity and, and improvising. And, and, you know, you're really playing off each other, even in some cases, each other's mistakes become opportunities because of that fluid nature. Now, they have some structure as well, right? Like th those bands, they, they, there's a music theory behind it. They, they know their progressions. They know their scales. They know how to, you know, how to come together and, and play off the same sheet of music. But once that's set, improvisation is actually their strength. And so uh, it gets to this concept of um, the fragility and anti-fragility. And there's this, this author named Nassib Taleb, who I think at some point was at Penn. I, I'm not sure. I think he might be at NYU now, but he wrote this book called Anti-Fragile. And basically the concept is that, you know, fragile systems, we all know, they break with complexity. They break with um, the unknown or stress or pressure. Then you have resilient and robust systems that are able to withstand pressure and stress but then you have anti-fragile systems, which actually, when you, when you add in unknowns, when you add in complexity, they actually feed off that and they get better. And so that gets back to this music analogy of those bands that I was talking about, those jam bands, those jazz ensembles, like that's what we want to strive to be, where when there's this complexity, there's this unknown, we actually feed off that and we actually get better because in baseball right now, and I don't think this is exclusive to baseball. I know it's in the sports industry and, and studying it in the OD program, it's in the business sector and beyond is there's this increasing rate of change and complexity and with analytics and algorithms and in baseball, there's sports science and neuroscience and all of these things. Like it's tough as an expert to keep up and to know everything and to know the precise right thing to do at each moment. And I write about in another piece of this article, um, you know, there's some statistics of this knowledge doubling curve where up until 1900, you know, it was something like every, it, it took the world's knowledge or the amount of information that would accrue in the world a hundred years to double, right? And then now we are getting to a point where knowledge doubling occurs almost every 12 hours, Right. And, and because of that, like organizations have become increasingly more complex. There's some statistic in there. I think like since the 1950s, um, organizations have gotten 55 times more complex in terms of reporting lines and information shared and interconnectedness and networks and things like that. And I think the assertion is in that type of environment, we can't structure our way into certainty. Right. We can't we can't do it all. So how do we like reimagine how we do this? And they, that gets back into the analogy you referenced. And for the listeners, I would highly recommend there's a book um, called Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. 
And in that, he, he explains this new operating environment, how it related to the military and how they, when they went into Afghan, Afghanistan and Iraq, um, they, the leadership had to really rethink the problem. And, and he talked about moving from this model of being the chess master to being that of a gardener, right? So the chess master knows exactly what to do and their, you know, the leadership is about moving the pieces and being the all-knowing expert versus the, the gardener is that where you're cultivating the environment, you're allowing things to grow and flourish and you're just kind of tending to the garden so that other people can rise and do what they need to do. Or, and so um, he also talks about this concept of being reverse mentored where the expert doesn't pull all the levers. They're the ones actually being mentored by everyone that are in different positions um, that are seeing exactly what's happening and they're able to, you know, to react and be fluid within the situation um, because they're the ones that are closest to the problem. I think the other thing I would reference and I write about this in my capstone is um, in Dana Kamenstein's class, we talked about this book bullish on uncertainty and I think one of the the authors of the book is from Penn is now the uh, the dean of the business school at uh, Boston College and in the book they study it's it, it's a research paper that was turned into a book but essentially they study two organizations and, and they're two banks two major financial institutions one was very focused on structure and the, you know, the old model of expertise, knowing exactly what to do. So you walk in there, if you went into a board meeting, everything's very structured, PowerPoint slides are fancy, everything's got a system to it. And then the other bank was the opposite. The other bank was very fluid. It was very, if you walked into a meeting, they'd say clients at first would be frustrated. because like, these people seem completely unprepared. Like they don't have fancy PowerPoints, nothing's polished, but everything was about co-creation and collaboration. And the, the biggest thing was the two organizations defined expertise differently. Um, one was all, you know, all about hiring people who have the most amount of knowledge, right? The kind of that individualistic human capital approach versus the other bank that was less structured was all about hiring expertise and defining it as social capital. And do you know where to go to get information? Do you, it's not about how much you know, it's can you pool resources? Can you form teams? Can you create a, a model of collective intelligence versus individualistic intelligence? And the, the key note there is what they found in the study is when there was there was um, you know, an un unexpected nature to the environment when there was added complexity, when there was uncertainty, that bank that was unstructured and looked at the social capital approach um, and that different model of expertise actually performed a lot better because they're able to adapt, they're able to be fluid, they were able to actually use um, that uncertainty as a strength as, as well other banks were, were rigid and were sticking to old practices that weren't working. They were able to just like roll with the punches and actually get better because of it. And so I think that that's an important thing for us to think about as we, we navigate an environment that, you know, realistically is just going to continue to get more complex and more uncertain. Yeah. So that, that's, that, that answer you just gave is actually a very good context for my next question for you was it, because in my introduction, I mentioned how you seek to learn from outside your organization and you bring in useful approaches and ideas, which you then try to integrate. So this openness to your environment is, uh, I think really fascinating. I've had the pleasure of sitting in on a couple of those things. They've been fantastic to listen to. So tell me more about how you do that and what specifically have you learned and integrated for the Indians? Yeah, I think it actually dates back to the University of Oregon. And we would talk about how the one thing we had going for us is we were smart enough to know how dumb we were. So we were going to connect with experts who are the best in the world at what they did and bring them in and learn from them. And so going back to what I said in the intro was we were always looking to read and apply things to our program. So we would read The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and how to create these elite level habits. I'm like, okay, how do we create great habits in our organization? Or we'd read Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And we're, okay, how do we apply that to creating a vision for our organization? So that part of the job you know, really energized me. And then a group of us, you know, we left Oregon and we went to the Philadelphia Eagles. And when we got to the Eagles, one thing we realized was, man, as a pro sports team, like, People want to talk to us. When we pick up the phone, um, you know, people will, will answer. So we could call Simon Sinek. We could call Charles Duhigg and say, hey, we read your book. We're applying it to our, you know, our NFL team. 
are you interested in having a conversation or even potentially visiting? And like, we'd have a hundred percent success rate with that, which is great is to have that opportunity because Stephen, if I'm calling, you know, Simon Sinek as just a fan and saying, Hey, do you want to have a meeting? Do you want to fly in and talk to me? Like that's not happening. Right. Yeah. So, so we realize we, we've got to leverage this platform that we have as a pro sports team to just build these connections and create these two way learning opportunities. Um, and so a, a few examples of that are, uh, one would be uh, this mission critical teams initiative, which actually started at Wharton there at Penn by uh, Dr. Preston Klein, who we formed a relationship with when we were in Philadelphia. And the Mission Critical Teams Institute basically is this conglomerate of these organizations that operate in high stakes uh, environments where decisions are a split second and in most cases lives are on the line. So it's bringing together leaders from Naval Special Warfare, you know, Army Special Forces, Penn trauma surgeons, NASA astronauts, uh, FBI hostage rescue, and essentially bringing them together because they're more similar than not. So how do we make sure that we're, we're taking this networked approach to learning and that the groups are figuring out ways to leverage each other and learn from each other? And so we actually got invited one year to attend one of their conferences because Preston thought it would be a good idea to maybe bring in a pro sports team who is in a completely different bubble and maybe, you know, still ch training at a high level, still thinking about like mental skills and all of these problems that we're facing these communities. But maybe we had seen things in a different light or had something that could help them. And so we, we attended that conference and it was incredible. And, and at the conference, we built this relationship with a, a commander of the Green Berets at the time who, um, you know, it's like, hey, can I bring my leaders up? to visit you at the Philadelphia Eagles and we can do a day or two, like an exchange of, Hey, here's how we do leadership in the army special forces. Here's how you do leadership in football and let's do an exchange. And, and sure enough, we did it. They came up for like two or three days and it was just incredible. Like the amount that we were able to learn from each other where it's like, yes, their, their context, their scenario is so much more important than we, what we were doing and so much more high stakes but there were these things in terms of training and leadership and culture building where there was a lot of overlap where we could learn from each other. And so I think having enough experiences like that just really showed us like, hey, when we actually learn the most, when we make the biggest leaps in our programming is when we actually get outside of our environment and get outside of our bu bubble and kind of take the blinders off and learn from these other, these other programs. And the one other example I'll give of that is, so Dan Coyle, who, um, you know, at the time he wrote, had written Talent Code, he hadn't written Culture Code yet, but we read Talent Code and we're blown away by it. Once again, okay, how do we apply this to our skill development? Um, we call Dan, we bring him in for a visit. He spends a few days with us. Um, at the time, we were trying to develop our coaches, their teaching skills, and give them some content in terms of how they could be better classroom teachers. And so Dan, part of the, the book, a chapter in it was about these KIPP schools. And that's kind of their mission is to go into underserved communities and really develop amazing teachers that can help the students and create this amazing culture to make up the achievement gap. So sure enough, he connects us with KIPP Philadelphia. We learn more from KIPP Philadelphia than you could ever imagine. Um, and they come in and actually help us with our teaching program. Um, but then he also says, Hey, there's these, these people out in Cleveland, the Cleveland Indians who I do a lot of work with. And, you know, they, they're thinking about the similar, similar type problems as you guys are like, can, can I make a connection? Sure enough, Cleveland Indians come and visit. We learn a ton from them. Hopefully they learn a ton from us. Um, you know, and, and fast forward now myself and, and James Harris, both of us who worked at Oregon and, and the Eagles together are now working at the Indians. That doesn't happen without this you know, kind of networked learning approach, the serendipitous, these connections and we're all learning from each other. And next thing you know, we're helping each other out. So it's one, the amount of learning that occurs by getting off the treadmill and having dialogue with groups that are outside our environment has just been tremendous. Um, but then two, it just leads to these connections that you never know what's going to pop up. So it's been, it's, it's been a, a, a core thing of at least of mine and, and an, an energizer for me um, in my career is these opportunities to, to learn from external people that do things at a high level. Yeah, it's great. You've done such uh, practical things with things you learn. So let's, let's delve into a little bit 
of your time in the organizational dynamics program because uh, I, I, I sense and I can tell from your answers that uh, some of the foundations of what you're now doing in your professional sports were laid in the various courses that you uh, took uh, during your time at Penn. So let's talk a little bit more about how some of the coursework you did in organizational dynamics is having an influence and an impact on what you're doing today in sports. Yeah, so I think there's a few things that come to mind in terms of coursework in OD and organizational dynamics that has influenced the work that um, I'm doing now and we're doing in the organization at the Cleveland Indians. And I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is, so when I joined um, the program at Penn there, I, I also joined the OCEC, the Executive Coaching Organizational Consulting Cohort there. And I think the, the coaching material has been um, incredible for me. And it's going back to some of the, the things we talked about earlier uh, in terms of this complexity and fluidity and all that, like work operating in a complex and certain environment, to me, coaching skills are the antidote to that. So yes, coaching, you, you think of executive coaching and, um, you know, developing a CEO or something like that, but the skills that actually go within, that are baked within coaching practice and coaching principles are all about, um, you know, it's, it's all about working with this, this environment where you're, um, you're very fluid and you're, it's all about asking questions. It's all about guiding and facilitating and not necessarily having all the answers, but helping people arrive at their own solutions. And, uh, we use a term in, in the Indians called guided discovery, right? So it's not about coming, being the expert and coming in with a solution. It's about how do we, as a group, ask each other good questions and kind of have this team coaching model so that we, uh, we can arrive at the best solution together. So I think looking at that stuff as just executive coaching is very limiting. Yes, it's great for that, but it's great in these other environments. And I think that's evidenced by places like Google that, you know, they did this massive, um, they did this massive study on their organization and, and studied um, the most high performing teams and the leaders of those teams in their organization. And, um, in this, this study that came out called Project Oxygen, they show how um, that the top eight attributes for what these leaders were doing to have these high-performing teams, technical skills was number eight. Coaching skills was number one on the list, right? So it, it just kind of shows that in these environments how important that skill set could be. So I had no exposure to that. Uh, coming into the program. But then, you know, once I got in that cohort and started learning this stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the secret sauce right here that we were missing. Um, I think the other thing with that is, yes, it, it helps in those environments, but then going back to the original intent of executive coaching, it, it's about um, having these developmental relationships with other people. And I think that's been huge in the role that I have. And, and, and your intro you mentioned that my job is to develop the developers and I'd say I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that because really I don't develop anyone, right? Like you, it, one thing we learned in, in this program is like actually adult learning and human development, people have to develop themselves, mm -hmm. right? We, we, it, you know, you, no one can do it for you. And so we use this adult learning pathway that we always um, use in our sessions with, uh, you know, our training sessions where it's essentially there's, it's all about reflection um, and adults learn through reflection, which then creates an insight. Once you have that insight, then you can turn that into a learning moment where you then operationalize it and it becomes your development. But you need some catalysts for sparking that reflection. And I think that's what this kind of coaching model can do. And so at the Indians, they, they hired uh, myself and one other person who didn't have baseball backgrounds. And so by definition, like we couldn't come in and develop anyone because we didn't have coaching expertise or scouting expertise or anything like that. But what we thought we could do is kind of just facilitate the learning process and create these catalysts and these sparks for reflection and, and then connect people to the resources they need. And I don't think, you know, I would have known any of this uh, had it not been for the OD program and um, learning these coaching skills um, and say another thing that comes to mind in terms of what I learned in organizational dynamics was from Michael Arena's classes in this complexity leadership model. 
um, looking at an organization as like this collection of networks and how do you identify different roles within that network in terms of like brokers who are able to to operate within different groups and kind of be these go-betweens they're able to facilitate information and help get things done across the organization and not just live in like one department or one domain so how do you see you know how people are are operating within these networks and then leverage that appropriately to get things done and that gets back to what we were talking about before the social capital approach um, where it's not necessarily about how much you know, but it's about being able to know who to go to to get things done and, and, and how you can operate within this network structure. I think, and then obviously, is, is Steve in your class, um, thinking about human capital and, and talent management a little bit differently, um, how organizational structures have evolved and how planning has to look a little bit differently or a lot of it differently because of that, right? Like, how do you succession plan when people are leaving their jobs every two to three years and taking other opportunities? Um, you know, how do you, in an unpredictable environment, how do you develop people for roles? And, you know, I learned a lot about that in your class and, and how to plan when things aren't linear. But then also thinking about, you talked about this, this windshield approach to development and, and performance management versus the, the, the rear view mirror approach where we're in the rear view mirror, we're evaluative, right? We're sitting down, we're having those typical performance management conversations where we're grading people and we're, um, you know, it's more about feedback on, on things that might be out of their control at this point in time. And it's tied to incentives and compensa compensation and all of that versus the non-judgmental approach, the helping people develop, the using the coaching skills, bringing a humanity and an, and an energy to the work. Um, and so I think from your class, um, learning about that was hugely helpful. And I was able to, to do some work and write some papers that have influenced me a ton um, in terms of applying that in a baseball context. Yeah, so you, like everybody else, uh that on our program has to end with a capstone project. So uh, clearly a, an awful lot was emerging for you during your experience on the course. And you certainly got inspired by many different people, both uh, professors within organizational dynamics and your own independent reading. So how did you choose your capstone project from all of this possibility? And um, so how did you decide what to write about? Yeah, well, I, I started making the classic mistake that I think we were warned about and that a lot of people make, and that is trying to boil the ocean and, you know, focus on a, a super broad topic. And so I went into the program knowing about the capstone and, and what the project was I'm like, okay, I'm going to create a blueprint for a sports organization to run effectively and incorporate these OD principles, right? So that's going to encompass everything and the organization. A and, theory of everything. Yeah, it's like, if, I'm, if you're the president coming in, here is the plan, like here is how you can build culture, give feedback, do sports science, like um, handle staffing, like all of these different things. Like we're gonna have this organizational blueprint that I was super fired up to build, but once I actually started down that path and doing the research and seeing how much actually has to go into that, um, like I was warned about from people like Alan Barstow and Charlene Russo and, uh, and others was, okay, I got to I got to narrow this thing down a little bit. Right. Right. Um, and so I think a few things were coalescing for me at that time. Um, you know, all happening through, uh, activities in the organizational dynamics program. I mean, it, it, I was doing a lot of reflection on my career and realizing how much I loved like the the cultural development and the staff development piece that I had started to get into the latter part uh, of my time at the, at the Eagles. And then in Michael arena's class, we were, we were doing exercises that involved, you know, reflecting on what energizes you, right? Like building a leadership philosophy to with your strengths in mind um, around the same time was doing through the, the cohort uh, 360 feedback, where I was getting feedback from, from peers and former um, bosses that I had worked for and, and figuring out, you know, from their perspective, what my strengths were. Um, and then I was doing a lot of reading through classes about learning organizations and the principles that went along with that. So all of this was kind of happening at the same time. And it, it helped me 
you know, get this focus and this energy around, okay, well, how do we actually build a learning organization in sports, right? What if that was my capstone, just focusing on creating a learning organization um, and applying those principles in a sports environment, which when you actually think about it is pretty unique because a lot of the principles of building a learning organization are counterintuitive to how sports is set up, right? So there's not a lot of psychological safety because the outcomes are very public you know, the average tenure of a head coach in most sports is about two and a half, three years. So the hiring and firing that occurs on a regular basis in professional sports makes it tough to, to create that foundation in that environment that, that is required for learning. There's a lot of individualistic compensation where people are getting um, bonuses and things based on individualized metrics. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, that's the problem set. But regardless, how can we still create this this learning organization um, despite all of these factors um, because it's that important and so that became kind of the the underpinning of my capstone and this notion of we talked about uh, Carl Rogers a lot in in the program and he has this line about how you can only develop others in direct proportion to the rate at which you develop yourself which think about applying that to pro sports, right? Where we have so much energy and emphasis in a typical sports model of player development. How do we develop the players? Um, how do we continuously feed resources into this player development system? Well, this capstone was, was taking a look at, well, what if we pulled that back a layer and you know, what about the people that are actually responsible for the development, the people that are walking the path with them, setting the goals, helping them utilize the resources? Like, what is the rate of their development and how do we enhance that? Um, and so, you know, while I was doing this and I was researching it, um, this, yeah, I was consulting with the Indians and they were looking at a similar challenge. And so, um, so through them, was starting to actually like be able to apply some of this stuff in, in real time, which was really cool. And, and, and as this was happening, they were creating this learning and development department um, that was going to be focused on essentially these principles. And so I was very lucky to be able to kind of craft a role, um, the one that I'm in now, as I was doing this capstone and, and learning this stuff in real time. So yeah. um, it, it created an incredible opportunity, but um, like I said, I made a lot of mistakes early on in terms of <laughs> trying to do it all. But then once I got that focused, it became incredibly energizing. Yeah. I think a lot of our students think that the capstone has to be their life's culminating work, right? And in many ways, it's just the beginning of, uh, of, of, of what they're really going to be up there to do. So we're, we're recording this uh, interview with you in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, the prospects for baseball being played at this point uh, we're sitting now at the in the middle of june prospects for baseball a little uncertain uh but i wonder if uh, as you think about that question i know that the cleveland indians has had to do quite a bit of adaptation given the fact that we've been in this suspended and remote environment for a while so what have you taken from your learning and development perspective to help out with your organization's survival through this difficult and challenging time yeah, well, in terms of the prospects of play, I wish that I, I had more answers than people probably already have by reading the media. I, I am I am optimistic. I am hoping that within the next few months, people will be seeing baseball on TV and that it becomes um, energizing for baseball fans and for the country to have sports back. So um, hoping, hoping that we can have some news here soon about us being able to get back and play. But I think one thing that's, that's important you mentioned Stephen, in terms of like how the organization adapted to this and some things we learned, like we went into it knowing, you know, this is a, this is a horrible situation. Um, not just for our organization, not just for baseball, but for the world, but you know, how do we as an organization lean into this and actually find some opportunity in terms of how we, go about our business and what we can learn as an organization, you know, that by the way, this pandemic is going to create a forcing function for us to have to do things differently. And so I think we've actually been able to create some new organizational habits that we will carry well beyond the pandemic. You know, we went into this realizing like, 
wow, like we thought we were good communicators before, you know, when we were um, in a normal working environment, but we are going to have to be incredibly thoughtful, incredibly deliberate about how we go about creating that communication, creating that clarity of, of um, what we need to accomplish, what the priorities are to make sure that, that we're aligned as we're all now working remotely for the first time. And so there's been some meeting structures, there's been some new communication structures that have been, like everyone would say, have been incredibly fruitful. And one of the challenges that's helped us solve is we always were wrestling with this fact that, I don't know the exact numbers, but about you know, only 25% of our organization is actually housed in Cleveland. So that's our front office and our major league team. But we have scouts, we've got coaches, um, we've got all kinds of other staffing positions that work in different environments. So we have minor league teams that are spread out across the country. You got scouts that are spread across the country and really the world. Um, and that makes up actually the bulk of our organization, but it's, it was hard to create this culture and this clarity, um, you know, that we felt like we had in Cleveland and make everyone feel a part of that year round when we were all operating remotely. And I think this, this pandemic has created a forcing function for us to really communicate effectively with each other, no matter where we are and whether it's through zoom and the ways we've used video calls and the ways we've um, set up structures to be constantly communicating and connecting with each other and, and, and learning and development. Our charge has been to, to connect the organization through learning. So how do we create learning opportunities where people from whether you're in Arizona or the Dominican Republic or Cleveland can come together and connect, but then also learn and, and, and develop and use this, and a pause in our operation to get better. Um, things like that have been emerging where we feel like in a lot of ways we may have strengthened as an organization and strengthened culturally. And, you know, we don't want that to end once we get back to um, some sense of normalcy. Um, you know, what can we learn from this situation and then what can we apply moving forward so that we become a better, more connected organization as we come out of this? Yeah, I, I, I sensed and I've participated in a couple of things you've done. What I've really been impressed by is sort of the level of experimentation that your organization has uh, practiced through this. You, you, in many ways, you have learned out loud uh, as you've gone through this situation because you have put together, I think, a very comprehensive learning and development as well as connectedness with not just with your own uh, organization, but with all organizations. Because there's, in my experience has been several other sports teams participating or riding on your, your programs. Yeah, no, it's, um, we've, you know, going back to the external learning opportunities, we've tried to involve a lot of others and a lot of other organizations, um, that we're partners with to come in and, and be a part of a lot of the stuff we're doing, um, mm -hmm. because they're dealing with the same thing. So right. if there's things we can open our doors to, to, to help others get better during this time. Um, it's been cool to have those external connections jump into some of our meetings and our development sessions. Um, but then on the flip side, that's open doors with other teams where we've been able to learn a ton from them. Yeah. You know, we have some teams that are, are starting to get back to a return to play. And, you know, by having those connections, we're able to learn how things are going and, and what we can pull from them as we do our return to play. And, um, it's uh, the whole experience has been surreal because it's, it is like what's happening in our country on a lot of levels is um, you know, deeply challenging, but at the same time, um, you know, our ability to try to, at least in our organization, figure out how do we get better because of it um, has kind of been the charge. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. This has been a, a great conversation and thanks for sharing the insights of, Baseball. I, we're going to end today's interview as we had doing in series two with a, a short series of five questions. Uh, I did not tell you what these questions were in advance, so uh, they're all surprises to you. So let me start with question one. What is one thing you would most like to do in your life that you have not yet done? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm going to go recreational on this one. I, would, I really want to go to Italy with my wife just me and her and travel all through like the Tuscany region and just wow. a, me like that's, 
there's no better way to spend days than doing things like that where you're you're relaxing having a glass of wine eating good food and unplugging and whenever we're able to get back to doing that uh, that that sounds even more enticing right now it does yeah it, uh, yeah let me know if you need someone to carry your bags for you I'd like to yeah come absolutely i'll invite you thank you in your opinion what is one thing the world needs right now to make it a better place to live listening we've got to be able to understand each other's perspectives and have curiosity and have dialogue um i think that would would solve a lot of the problems right now yeah if you were back in school today thinking about starting a career what would you want to be when you grew up god you know what this is this is going to sound really cliche but i can't think of anything else like i said i was able to like find this role that um that i that I, I love and it energizes me every single day and so right now i'm happy where i'm at now i could go the the crazy route and say you know if i was going to be something completely different something like an astronaut has always enticed me or something that's um that's completely out of left field or you know i wish i had some athletic talent where i could be a pro ball player um, and have that experience but to be honest i I wouldn't want to design it any other way than how I have it now. Well, you do seem well suited for the job that you're actually in right now, so that's good. So what hobby or activity outside of your work brings you joy? Um, it, it's sad because it's related to my work, but reading. Like any free moment I have, I just love to, to dig into books and read. Um, and other than that, it's just hanging out and spending time with uh, my wife and son. We've been, during this pandemic, we've been taking a lot of walks. So, you know, when the weather's nice outside, just taking a nice long walk and, and relaxing and kind of getting away. And my last question, and I think uh, you're going to have a hard time figuring this one out, I think, because I think so many people have uh, uh, speak to you in this way. But what person, living or dead, has inspired you the most? Well, that's easy. That's Abraham Lincoln. Okay. I actually, I named my son. His middle name is Abraham. So oh. done a lot of studying of who he was and what he was about and how he led. And so he's, he's definitely number one. Well, great. Well, thanks, Josh. It's been wonderful to see you again. And thanks for stopping by our Zoom room today uh, with a great story. And um, I think uh, inspiring to our current students in the program as well as prospects for the program, because I think you clearly walked out of the program with a, a deeply enriched sense of learning and development and commitment to take that to meaningful heights. And we're very proud of what you've done in your career and look forward to hearing more about your life and work uh, going ahead. So my guest today has been Josh Gibson, Director for Learning and Development for the Cleveland Indians and an Organizational Dynamics alum. My thanks to Dan Shields for producing today's show. I'm Steve Hart, and this has been a Learning Aloud podcast from the University of Pennsylvania.